All right, so today we're just going to continue on uh, recursion. Uh, we already took a look at this uh, toy example that I went through uh, where we've got a countdown, right? Uh, and basically the idea of recursion is that you can simulate a, um, a typical you know, a for loop or just a loop, right? It allows you to do simple things without a loop, but the, at a cost, right? You are, you are abusing the call stack. Uh, and we saw this, I, I, th I think we looked at the visualization, right? Where each call stack had its own version of n, right? Whereas if I had written this as a for loop, I would only have had one variable, i, and then it gets incremented. i is one, two, three, four, right? Uh, instead, I'm abusing the call stack to simulate that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, loop. Uh, we also looked at recursion in general is just something that references itself. Uh, in coding, Recursion refers to a chunk of code, a function, that calls itself, that makes calls to itself, one or more calls to itself. Uh, and in mathematics, we've seen fractal, fractals and self-similar objects. And you, typically, whenever you see a recursion, you always see the Fibonacci sequence, right? That is the go-to example for presenting recursion in programming. If you've not seen it before, it starts out at one, or at least my definition that we're going to use here, starts out at one, one, two, three, five. You see the pattern here that the next one is the sum of the two previous ones, right? Uh, and that's what the definition is. If n is one if, or n is two, then the value of this function is one. Otherwise, it's the value of the function of n minus one, the one previous to it in the sequence, plus the one two previous to it. Right? Uh, there's nothing special about the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, it is a, uh, a homogeneous recurrence relation of degree two. Right? Uh, there are dozens of them out there. In fact, you'll have one next week, the Jacob Sol, uh, which is just a yet another a, a degree two uh, nonlinear uh, hom a homogeneous recurrence relation. I forget what it is. Uh, but you can solve these pr things pretty readily, readily and get a closed form solution. Uh, what we're going to do, however, is we're going to use this as an example of how to design these functions. But then we're going to realize that this is an example of why you don't do recursion. Then we're going to look at a solution that doesn't use recursion or that, that mitigates the costs of, and uh, risks of recursion. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this countdown right here. Just make sure that the audio is working. Yep, good. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this toy example. And let's go ahead and start with a Fibonacci right, function here. It's going to take as input an integer n, right? Why? Well, because we have an input n here, right? And it's just f of n, f short for Fibonacci function, whatever you want to call it, right? We're going to call ours Fibonacci. Now, these are going to get very, very big, very, very quickly. So we could return an integer, but then we're limited to 2.147 billion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to up this immediately to a long. A long is a 64-bit twos complement integer. Don't worry about what that means. Let's just ask, ask Wolfram Alpha here, uh, how big is it? Two to the 63rd minus one. It's 64 bits, but we're only using 63 bits because we need one of those bits for the sign, zero, or uh, zero for positive, one for negative. Minus one because we start at zero. So it's, it's pretty big, nine quintillion. We'll be able to represent anything up to that value, okay? All right, so how do I implement this function? We need to understand what the basic conditions are. Remember that a function, or that a recursive function is basically simulating a loop. And what are the three parts to a loop? You have an initialization where you start, n, right? You have a continuation. Should I stop the recursion, right? Because you don't want to run away recursion like we did last time where it was a countdown and then we started negative and then we went all the way down to a stack overflow with 260,000 function calls. And you need to make progress towards that uh, 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 termination condition, right? So every recursion, a recursive function needs one or more base cases. That is your termination condition right there, right? You need to know when to stop, right? And just return a value. What about the Fibonacci sequence here? What are our base conditions here? When n is one or n is two. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and put that in there. If n is one or n is two, then I will return the value of the function, which is just one. Right? 
you probably also want to think about some side conditions here, right? So, for example, some base cases may be for error handling, right? Countdown. What we did is we put in another condition in there that if it were negative, then we said error immediately. We're not counting down from negative 10, negative 12, dot, 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 right? So what's, what's the error condition here? Well, anything that's defined as less than zero. So if n is less than or equal to zero, we'll go ahead and return, I don't know, what's a, what's a value here that we could return to indicate, nope, something went wrong there. Right? Remember that we're not really designing this for error handling. We're designing this to actually give you a value. If you wanted to, of course, you could design this for error handling and pass in a long right, result, right? and then put the result in there. We're not doing that though, we're just keeping it simple. So what's a value that I could return to indicate, this is not a Fibonacci number, you gave me some bad input. Negative one, right there. Right? Could be negative 42, negative 101. Don't be fancy, just negative one. Uh, all right, and I, I, it could be zero according to my definition, but if you look up the Wikipedia definition, sometimes uh, they begin at zero. So, uh, and zero, one, one, two, three, dot, dot. Right? We're not gonna do that though. All right, so those are my base conditions. And then finally, when you make those recursive calls, you need to make progress towards one or more of those base conditions. So if I start at a Fibonacci of 10, I want 10. Right? And I'm going to work down minus one, minus two. I need to be making progress towards those termination conditions, those base conditions. So else, return. Uh, actually, let's put it into a variable here because we're going to use that later. Result is equal to Fibonacci of n minus one and Fibonacci of n minus two. I am making progress there. I'm not calling and 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 over and over again i'm not going up in the wrong direction just like the countdown would if what happens if i went up instead that's a count up right so i'm making progress towards my termination condition and let's go ahead and return the result there okay all right let's go ahead and get rid of this and get rid of the challenge and let's go ahead and create an integer n here and just for testing purposes ad hoc testing purposes I'm just going to read this in from the command line so that I can re I don't have to recompile it every single time. Right? Uh, one, there we go. All right, add some boilerplate code there to check for the correct number of, of conditions, et cetera, et cetera. All right, a uh, uh, long result is equal to Fibonacci of n. Right? And then let's print it out to make sure that it's right. When you print a long, then you need L U or L D, excuse me long digit right uh there we go and line and result there right. gc gcc demo dot c right. wonderful let's run it uh i don't know 10. what's the 10th fibonacci number 55 is that right well here we go there's 55 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10. Right. good Let's test one more, 11, there we go, 89. That's what was over there. Uh, I didn't write it down in the notes here, but what would the next Fibonacci number be? 55 plus 89, so 144, okay. Let's test it for large numbers here, 60. Whereas the small numbers, that was pretty quick. 60 is now taking a while for some reason. It's probably still do. I don't know. We'll, we'll let that run for a while, and I'll ask you. Have you ever, uh, for those who have seen recursion in, say, a prior programming course or whatever, or maybe just an exercise, what's the first thing that you were presented? Oh, so, uh, oh, uh, uh, a stack overflow. Okay. Uh, I mean, I mean, what example was given? Was it the Fibonacci sequence, or was it something else? You know, anybody else has ever seen recursion before? All right, well, this is the go-to. And while we're waiting for this, I think it's a, uh, first of all, it's a terrible example. Why? Because who cares about the Fibonacci sequence, right? You're not solving any real problems here. You're not doing any real work, right? It, it's, count, it's a counterproductive, um, you know, a stupid example uh, that, that, that has all this mysticism around it and stuff like that, right? 
But I can turn that around because any bad example is, can also serve as a good example for why you don't do recursion. Is it becoming clear why you don't do recursion here? Right? So let's understand what's going on. Here's a computation tree for Fibonacci just of five. Right? How many times do we end up computing or calling a function for Fibonacci of one? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, keep that in mind. How many times do we end up ca uh, calling Fibonacci of two? One, two, three, five, three, keep that in mind. How many times do we call Fibonacci of four? One, and how many times do we call Fibonacci, or, uh, four, Fibonacci of five? One. How many times, oh, I skipped three, didn't I? All right, how many was that? One, two. So did you remember all those numbers in your mind? I saw one, one, two, three, five. And if we'd gone more, eight. If we'd, got, if we'd gone Fibonacci of six, we would end up calling Fibonacci of one eight times. In other words, calling Fibonacci of 60 is going to end up making roughly Fibonacci of 60 that many function calls. Right. How big is that? Millions, billions, trillions. 1.5 trillion. So let's just do an estimate here, a rough estimate. Uh, I don't know. Let's say that uh, we say that we can do, I don't know. This is way overestimate here. Maybe we can do 1 billion function calls per second. That's 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day. There we go. All right, so it'll, it's gonna eventually compute. Right? In fact, is it done yet? Nope. This is a way overestimate, by the way. What if we can do one, only a one million? All right, there we go. That's 17 days, All right? Okay, so should I wait around here, waiting for this to compute? Probably not. Let's go ahead and kill it. Right. In fact, could you, what, what if I did Fibonacci of 100? And suppose that I did have this awesome supercomputer that can do a billion, op or no, that's a trillion, right? That's a trillion operations per second, right? We call, uh, usually we, these are measured by flops, floating point operations per second, right? So suppose that you can have teraflops, right, per second. Uh, there's no commercial uh, processor that can do that, right? When you, uh, I don't know, Anybody into hardcore gaming and like they're there. All right, so what, what, how many flops can the, your current machines run? I don't know, tell, tell me what's the, what, what, what is the uh, best processor you can buy right now? An i9? Past, uh, 11? <laughs> okay, so what, what, what's the best processor I could get right now? Horizon or Verizon? Horizon. Horizon. Risen nine. All right. Uh, flops. How many? How many T flops can it do? I doubt that it's going to actually be tell you. Uh, all right. No. All right. Whatever it is, let's just suppose that it's that. Right. So, how many years are you looking at there? 4,100 years, right? 41 centuries in order to do, say, uh, and again, this is not <laughs> anywhere close to that, uh, but if I were to do 100 here, we'd be sitting here for a very, very long time. Right? So how in the world can Wolfram Alpha do it? It can do this math. It can compute the 100th Fibonacci number, right? So there are a lot of ways that you can get around recursion, right? So first of all, let, let's, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Why is recursion good or why might you hear folks say that recursion is good? Right. So it can be useful, it can be helpful, and so there are some good things about it. Many divide and conquer style algorithms are presented initially as recursive. Right. And we're, we might look at one uh, later today. Uh, it's a good way to think inductively. So you haven't taken maybe proof course yet, you will next semester 235. Uh, but there's a proof by induction where you assume it for a base case and then you assume that it's true for a value x and then you show that those two things together 
imply that it's also true for value x plus 1. And you've concluded that it's true for everything right? because of induction. That's exactly recursion. You have a base case, and then you have, you're making a progress towards uh, your, the base case by assuming this stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Just in case you think that I've been showing you toy examples, there are functional programming languages that either discourage or do not have the same uh, control structures that we have in a procedural style language like C or Java. Uh, Java is OOP. Uh, instead, these are called functional programming languages, where you don't have loops. You don't even have variables. Right? Instead, it is all just a matter of function calling, function calling, function, and you have parameters and results, and that's it. Uh, this, however, forces you to think like a mathematician. Right? Uh, that you have to, uh, yeah, and that's not really how most people think. Right? And so, that, uh, their, their, their use is quite limited, in my opinion. Uh, there are, that is certainly, th that's the reason why they're not in widespread use. Right? Recursion can also lead to simple or clean or beautiful code right? that is easily understood. One person's simple is another person's complex. One person's beautiful is another person's ugly. And one person's easily understood is difficult to understand. Right? All of these good things are quite subjective. Now, what's the bad? Well, immediately, like you said, you risk stack overflow and runaway recursion. In fact, some organizations, NASA, for example, their style guides forbid the use of recursion uh, because of the, these risks and because they want their embedded systems to work. You can't abuse the stack if it's small and tiny and defenseless, right? Our, our stack is, of course, four megabytes, right? Yeah, you can go ahead and abuse that a little bit. Uh, but when you're in an embedded system and your stock is measured in, I don't know, kilobytes, 100 kilobytes, right, you, can't, you can't afford that luxury anymore. Right? Um, it isn't even necessary. Uh, you, I mean, you, know, you can still abuse the call stack uh, and the stack is limited. Uh, in fact, it isn't even necessary because uh, most, in fact, all recursion can be rewritten as a regular loop or you simulate the recursion. Right? Instead of using the call stack, you can create your own stack in the heap. And now you're not limited by four megabytes anymore or 100 meg uh, 100K, right? Now you're only limited by the amount of memory that you have. Right? And worst of all, of course, is this Fibonacci sequence demonstrating that a naive way of doing this leads to exponential problems, right? Uh, that you're going to end up doing trillions and trillions and trillions of recalculations. So, how can we eliminate that recursion, right? Well, first of all, you can always rewrite it as a non-recursive function. Uh, you can always use regular old for loops and data structures to simulate the recursion, right? Another technique is called tail recursion. And this allows you to, t if you structure it just right, this allows the compiler to realize that it doesn't need all of these stack frames. Instead, it can reuse the same stack frame over and over and over again. So it's a little bit of optimization down at the lower level that optimize, optimizes your recursion away. Right? Because at the end of the day, guess what? Everything is run on wires. Everything is run on a machine. And everything is procedural at the end of the day. You run this, uh, this command, then this command, then this command, then this command. Right? Another technique is memoization. I, I briefly mentioned this last time, I think. It is not memorization. It is memoization. Right? You can use, go, uh, go ahead and reuse recursion. Go ahead and use recursion, but dot dot dot. Don't recompute uh, previously computed values. Right? Instead, store them, or and here's the term that we use: you cache them. So, what is a cache or a cache? It's a storage unit, right? Your a cache of weapons, you, it's a storage unit that you put a bunch of stuff in, right? Uh, a cache of uh, food or whatever, foodstuffs, right? It's where you store stuff. So go ahead and pay for the recursion. Compute this number right here. But if you ever need to recompute it, don't recompute it. Don't, don't spend your time and resources recomputing it. Instead, once you've computed it, put it into the cache and then look it up. Have I computed that before? Uh, the basic steps are going to be as follows. Basic steps. Right. We're going to keep, maintain, 
a table, right, or cache of values, right? Initially, it will hold dummy values to indicate not yet computed, right? That's what we're going to have, right? Then oh, you look it up, look it up. Right? If computed already, use it. Otherwise, pay for the recursion. But cache the result, right? store the result. Seems pretty simple enough. I don't know why we needed a fancy term like memoization for it, right? Um, of course, you can't necessarily store everything. Right? Uh, caches are usually uh, small. In fact, memory caches are small. Uh, your processor has an onboard memory uh, that, 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 that's stored. And then of course, of course, it can't store the entire program. It can only store a piece of memory at, at a time. So uh, when the processor needs a uh, something in memory and it's in the cache, it uses it. Otherwise, it then goes, okay, that's a cache miss. So I need to go to secondary memory, RAM, right? And then if it's there, great, use it, right? That's a little bit slower, but not as slow as say a hard drive. If it's not there, then it goes out to virtual memory on a hard drive and then loads it up, loads it up, loads it up, right? Uh, and why? Because your processor memory is expensive and small. That's why, I mean, it's small because it's expensive, but it's fast. RAM is going to be a little bit slower, a little bit less expensive, but a little bit larger because of it, right? And then finally, you know, virtual memory on a, a hard drive, that's nothing, right? That, I mean, nothing as in terms of cost, but, it is damn slow. Right? So you have all these trade-offs. Why can't we just have infinite, free, fast memory? Well, because there's a trade-off, right? Uh, we can't all afford the, uh, what are we up to now? 3090 TA, TIs? <laughs> so 4080 TI is the best? Or 4090? Is that even better than TI? Is there a TI 90? Okay, all right. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to just go ahead and quit, the, quit this at this point. Right? Let's reorient this so that it uses memoization. Let's redesign this function, first of all. We're going to take n, but also we're going to take a table of values, right? of long values table. I'm not going to bother uh, passing in the size here because I'm going to assume that it's big enough. Right? Okay? So base case, no recursion there. Base case, no recursion there. However, we're not gonna do this anymore. We're going to check to see if it's already computed. One, check if already computed. If so, use it, right? In other words, return it. Right. Two, else, not yet computed. So, compute it recursively. Store it, and then return it. Right. So two things. First of all, how do I check to see if it's already computed? Well, all my values are stored in this table. I'm going to look at the table for table sub n. And if that's computed, if that is computed, then return table sub n. I'm just using the n value there as my index. So how do I write if table sub n is computed? So we need a, a, a value here to indicate that it's not computed. What value would you use? Negative one, why? <laughs> that was a value that we used to indicate error, right? Let's just go ahead and there's no Fibonacci number that has a value of negative one. So if table sub n is equal to n negative one, uh, or not equal, excuse me, not equal to negative one, then we know that it's been computed, it is being stored in this table, and we'll end up returning it. Else, okay, if it's not yet computed, we're there, we need to compute it recursively. Okay, fine, there. I will pay for the recursion, because we don't know what it is yet. But remember that you need to pass in this table. Table and table, because we changed the function. Once I've got that result, I need to store it. Table sub n is equal to result. Oops, spell it correctly. Right. And now once I've got it stored, I now need to return it. Return result. Okay, there we go. 
Now take a look again at this diagram here. What am I effectively doing? The first time we, uh, we compute, say, Fibonacci of three, it gets computed recursively, right? This branch down here. But the second time that we compute Fibonacci of three, do I need to do this entire sub-branch down here? Nope. So it gets chopped off right there. In fact, uh, we don't even need to compute Fibonacci of three. Uh, actually, yes, we do in this case. Uh, but the first time that uh, we compute Fibonacci of two down here, right? You, we pay for the recursion with these things right here. But the second time that we do it, we don't need to recompute it. So this gets chopped off right here. So this big giant tree that is exponentially sized, what memoization doing is doing is it's going uh, and chopping off each one of these branches until it looks more like a stick, right? And that is way more tractable, right? And that's no longer exponential. That's gonna be whatever the depth of this is. In other words, N, right? So a good philosophical question, how many branches can you ch chop off of a tree before it's no longer a tree? One's not gonna do it. All of them certainly is, but at what point is it no longer a tree? Right. So now it's a stick, okay? Let's go ahead and try this again. Oh, sorry, I forgot the other part. The initialization, right? So I actually need a table here, first of all. So let's build our table first. Long star table is equal to a call to malloc, long star malloc, size of long times, how big should it be? That's a good question. Well, I want n of them, right? Careful, right? I want Fibonacci of n. In other words, I want eventually tables of n. If it's of size n, say five, is there gonna be an index five? Nope, zero, one, two, three, four. So I need to make it one larger. Do not confuse that with a null terminating character that you've been using in your strings, right? I'm only adding one, so I don't have to worry about subtracting off of an index, okay? I want everything from table of n, table of n minus one, table of n minus two, dot, 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 table of one. What happens to table of zero? I effectively don't use it, right? Four int i equals zero, i is less than n plus one. Why? Because I need to go all the way to the end, i plus plus. Table sub i is equal to negative one. There. I've set up my table. I have not yet computed any of the values. Fibonacci, you're gonna do it for me. Table, gcc. Now let's test some things first to make sure we didn't break anything. 10, that's 55. 11 was 89, and 12 was 144, if I recall. Maybe you can just do the at addition right there if you want. Right? But now let's go ahead and try 60. You remember something that we estimated would take, you know, what was it, 17 days or 17 years or so, whatever it was, right? Immediate. Let's, uh, let's make sure it's correct, right? Fibonacci of 60. There. What is it? One, five, four, eight. One, five, four, eight, I buy it. Now we're probably not going to get the correct answer because we're still susceptible to overflow here, but at least we'll get the wrong answer quickly. There we go. Oh, maybe that is the right answer. Maybe it is. 100. Three, five, four, two, two. Wow, okay, three, five. Oh no, that def definitely wrong. Right, we've got overflow here. Let's look at what memoization would look like over here in Java, right? where I have more sophisticated tools. Right? For example, I'm no longer limited by 60, 32 bits or 64 bits if I use big, big integer. Right? I'm also no longer limited by just using arrays as my tables. Instead, what if we used something else? Basically what I want is something that maps n to f of n. What was the key word that I just said there? Map, all right? So public, static, final, map. I will map integers to big integers. Right. Results, or values, let's say values. Is equal to new hash map of the same. And there. We need to bring this in. Yeah, 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 import it. It's java.math. Uh, 
come on, why can't you give me a hash map? Hash set, hash map. There we go, all right. So let's write our Fibonacci function using this map instead. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and steal a lot of this code right here. And let's just go ahead and replace right, what we need to. Public, static, it's not a long, it's gonna be a big integer. Right? We don't need this anymore because we made the uh, map here static, so it belongs to the class. Right. Uh, if you're going to return negative one there, um, I'm, I don't want to have to worry about that right now. I think big integer dot negative one. There is no negative one. So one, and then I'd have to subtract it. I'm not going to worry about that. There we go. All right. Oops. Let's just go ahead and do that. Right. So we, we get to our base cases. I will return big integer dot one. Right. So those common one, two, uh, those values are zero. Those values are so common, they just give you uh, these, uh, these values. Right? Otherwise, I need to check to see if it's already computed. So I don't have my tables here. I have a values dot has, or that has key, is it? Contains key? Key, contains key, there it is. There we go. Contains key of n. Right? And if it does, then what do I do? I just return it. Values dot get n. Right? So if you have that key, in other words, that n value there, then it will just simply get the f of n that's already been computed. Otherwise, I pay for the recursion. Remember, I do not have to have the table anymore. There. And it's going to be a big integer. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, and then I can't just add big integer to big integer. This one will return a big integer, so what I can do is dot add that one. There we go. There, there's the result. The first one returns a big integer. I could put that into a variable. Here's, here's another way of looking at it. Integer A is equal to that. Big integer B is equal to that minus two. And then the result could be a dot add b. Right. I was just doing that in one line. Okay. Now I need to put it back into my map. Values dot put n is going to map to result. And then finally return the result. Okay. So n over here is 10. Uh, big integer result is equal to Fibonacci of n system dot out dot print ln. I'll just go ahead and do result. Don't get fancy. What was that again? 55, I think. Yay. What would it be if I upped it to 11? 89. Seems to work. 12. Save. Run. 144. Now let's really put it through its paces. 100, all right? Remember we got overflow with a long. This is a big integer, it can handle whatever. Was that right? 3542, 3542, blah, 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 blah. In fact, I can give you any amount here, 1,000. It's just gonna be giant, right? Can I give you 10,000? Find out, nope. Why? Because all, we're all back here to the bad. You risk overflowing your stack. This is not runaway recursion. I actually want to compute 10,000 things. But what about the stack space on this Java virtual machine here? 10,000 is too much. It's going down 10,000 function calls. Uh, with C, we could get away with it because it was only one integer per stack frame. Java here uh, is either the stack frame, uh, the, the stack space is much smaller or each stack uh, frame is taking up way more. That's, prob that's probably the case because Java is very, very memory hungry. Right? All right, so what's the real solution here? Write a for loop with two variables. All you have to do is keep track of the two previous values. You have a temporary value here to add them together, right? And now you can throw away the, uh, the oldest one. That means that you now can put 
this one, uh, this one into that one, this one into that one, and you're done. Right? Two variables, no recursion, simple for loop. Right? But then again, why are you computing the Fibonacci sequence over and over again? Right? It's because it's a common uh, job interview, <laughs> stu is a stupid job interview question. <laughs> Or they'll give you something that you haven't seen before with just different numbers or whatever, different coefficients. All right. All right, with the remainder of our time here, what I wanted to do is show you some actually useful recursion. Right. So for example, we'll go ahead and leave that. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, let's hard code this to 10 so that it doesn't bother us too much. All right, there we go. Uh, let's go ahead and create an integer array here, right? consisting of, say, eight values. One, two, five, four, three, six, seven, eight. Right? Now, I intentionally, uh, I don't want to think about it, but um, uh, I put eight things in there, okay? I want to sum them up to do, add up the elements. Dot, dot, dot. Right? Normally, and I would too, I would simply just have a for loop to do this, a function, a for loop in a function, so that I don't have to rewrite it all the time. Right? Now let's think about how we can use recursion to do it instead, right? because we're going to ha intentionally hand, uh, you know, uh, handcuff ourselves and not use that tool. So let's write a function to do it first of all. Int sum. Right? It takes a const char, or it's const not char, int array right? of a certain size, maybe, I don't know. We'll come back to that. Right. If it was a regular old for loop, we just start writing the for loop here. Think about how we can use recursion though. Think about the countdown, right? That started at 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and then blast off. What if instead of printing something, we actually did something, right? So as always, what, are, uh, what is the first thing we need to do? We need to make sure that it ha has one or more base conditions here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work backwards. Int index. There we go. And if I've gotten down to the first element, right? If index is equal to zero, then I'm really only dealing with one element. What's the sum of the first element right here? one in that particular case but in general what is it it's just whatever it is return array sub index so it's a it's kind of a de uh, it, this is kind of a decrease in conquer right ah uh, here i've got five things i don't know how to i don't know how to add these up right okay well i know how to i, I, I get, let, let's not, let's throw one of them away and not worry about it for now i still don't know how to add these things up all right, throw them away, throw them away until you're down to one thing. You, everybody knows how to add one thing, right? Just that thing, right? Else, okay, so like I said, now I've got n things, five things. I don't know how to add these up, but if somebody else did all the work for me of adding these four things up, of course, that's one number. I can just go ahead and add this other number over here, right? I could return the array sub index plus and then I don't know how to add the rest of the stuff up, but that sum function does. Index minus one. Why? Because I'm taking the index for myself here. Right? So do you see that pattern? Let's come down out, uh, the, over here and let's see if it works. Int total is equal to sum of array. And we'll st where should we start our index here, by the way? Seven, why? Because there are eight things in there. So we'll start it at seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And the total is going to be percent D and the line total. What, how, what should it be if you add up one through eight? Does anybody know the Gaussian formula? Natural numbers one up to eight should be uh, 34, is it? 36. All right. So why? because seven plus eight, or seven times eight, excuse me, 56 divided by two. No, that's wrong. Eight plus nine, oh, sorry, eight plus nine. Eight plus nine, or eight times nine is 72 divided by two, that's 36. 
There we go. I had forgotten it too. All right. It's just n plus or n times n plus one all over two. That's the Gauss's formula. Okay. All right. Wonderful. All right. I did, did I have to write a uh, a loop to do that? No. It would have been better to do so. Here's another way of looking at it. And I don't have my iPad set up, so I'll, I'll just do it up here on the board. And hopefully, it shows up in the live stream. If not. Think about how you've got numbers. Eight, four, three, seven, nine, two, one, eight. Right. So what would, how would you end up adding these on a piece of paper or in your head or something like that? Would you go like a computer, like a for loop here and say, all right, eight and four, that's 12. Okay, 12. 12 and three, that's 15. Okay, that's 15. 15 and seven, that's 22. And eventually, if you've got enough numbers here, you're gonna make a mistake. Instead, what do you do? You set up a tournament. These two together are 12. 10, 11, 9. You repeat that. You set up another tournament here. Right? At least this is how I've always done it. Anybody follow that? Right? You, you, you chunk them. You, 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 what you've done is you've divided and conquered. That's too much work. Right? That's too much work. That's too much work. Well, no, that, that's easy. If I just had two numbers, I can do that in my head. If I had two numbers, I can do that in my head. If I had two numbers, I can do that in my head. So if you, div you can take a divide and conquer approach, what would that look like instead? Let me go ahead and call this sum A. Right. Int sum B, let's say, const int array. Now I'm not going to take just one array here, one, one integer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take two integer, uh, two uh, in indexes. Right? I want I want to know what the sum is from this index all the way to this index, inclusive. Right? All right. So I'm going to have a left index, left, and a right index. Right? I'm initially going to start them where, and uh, uh, let's do that. And total for the second one. And I need to get rid of that int. There you go. Sum b. Right. Well, I want to compute everything from 0 up to 7. Okay. I want to compute everything from index 0 up to index of whatever the size is. That's my left and right. Now we need to think inductively. We need to think not in terms of the beginning and the end, we need to think in terms of left and right. This just this generic range right here. I don't know how to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide and conquer it. I'm going to divide it into two spot, uh, two places. All right. Actually, before I do that, what's my base condition? I'm getting ahead of myself there. So think about the left and the right index here. What they're going to do is they're going to eventually meet in the middle. All right. So. When they meet in the middle, what is that? Left is equal to right. And if I've got left is equal to right, what's the value of that range? It's just that thing. Right? Left or right, whatever. Take your pick. Right? Might also want to do some error checking here. If, now, think about left and right here. They come and they meet in the middle and then they go past each other accidentally. What is the sum of nothing? This is an empty, uh, uh, empty range right here, right? So what is the sum of nothing? If left is greater than right, then what should I return? Zero. That's the sum of nothing. Right? Otherwise, we've then met in the middle and we'll go ahead and return that value. Else, what do I do? I break it apart. I have got from left to right, int middle index. Right? I'll just call it middle though. You tell me, what index is that? Okay, so uh, left plus right, keep going. Divided by two, all right? Why? That's the average, right? If you've got two numbers on the number line, how do you get the number right in the middle? 
you average them together, right? Now, be careful, don't do this in real life in practice because this is susceptible to overflow. We'll talk about that later when we look at uh, searching and sorting. So I will return sum or sum b of the array of the left up to the middle plus sum b of the array of middle plus one. Why plus one? Because middle is over here. I don't want to count that guy twice. Right? All the way to the right. I'm essentially taking this ray and I'm looking at the middle here and I'm chopping it in two and then I'm splitting it up. There we go. GCC. Uh, some B. Some B, some B. Where? Oh, uh, where? Oh. Thank you. Right there. All right. Yeah, don't worry about that. Uh, some A. Oh, sorry. If I'm going to recursively call it, I need to call it the correct one. Otherwise, that would have been a seg fault. There you go. Same exact answer, but a completely different approach. A divide and conquer strategy. If you want to defeat a, uh, an army coming at you, what do you do? You split it up, uh, force them to split up into two, right? And then you use your, your, your smaller force that could not have stood against that army, but you can stand against this one army that's half as big, once you defeat them, then go to the other army and defeat them. Repeat that over and over again until you have the superior forces, right? And in this case, it's the superior forces, just one, one addition. Right? All right, so it won't matter for those on the live stream, but uh, we've got our student advisory board today from 11 to one. So my help hours downstairs will be cut short. Uh, I would encourage you to attend. It's in 348, there's free pizza. It is your opportunity to come and tell us about, give us feedback about the program or just eat pizza. You don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, or if you want to, you can go to your SAB uh, student advisory board representatives and tell them, you know, uh, I think that this should change. Or I love this about the program. We should have more of it or something like that. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments or just want to sit and, uh, and kibitz, listen uh, to other people vent and, and great. Uh, come on up. Uh, we're in 348. Uh, that start it goes from 11 to 1. All right. All right. Then on Monday, uh, flops is a great turn. Yes, it is. Right. It's floating point operations per second, uh, if I didn't say that before. Uh, but uh, otherwise, on Monday and Wednesday of next week, we'll start introducing searching and sorting. Remember, there is no class Friday of next week because of um, a committee arrangement that I've got. Uh, and then, of course, the, I, I never have class on Monday of the Thanksgiving week. So as far as this class is concerned, you're, uh, after, after your hack on Thursday, you're good for the Thanksgiving thing.